Great, does this work? Okay. Hi. So I'm going to do a talk in three ampersands. I'm going to talk a little bit about day jobs and side projects, even though I think both of those are misnomers. I'm going to talk about R&D and why and how you might do it, although R&D is also a misnomer, and then there will be questions. So to start with day jobs. So my day job is at Moving Brands, and the day job of my day job is that we are a design agency, and we do design across brand, experience design, communications, as well as strategy around all of those areas. And the world we live in looks something like this. Um, and sort of, you know, when we put our front face to the world, we look relatively polished. But as I imagine all of you know, once you peel away that polish, the process is quite messy. So my day job, at my day job, is user experience design, which looks a little more like this. So a lot of talking to people. If I were to do it proportionally, that picture of talking to people would be a lot bigger. A lot of systems diagrams, a lot of trying to understand people and their needs and articulate that back to other people so that they can understand it. And it all gets a bit abstract. So partly to maintain my sanity, I do a lot of side projects. So I, I got into this field because I like to make things. And I still like to make things. And I continue to make things. I like to make things in code. I like to play with electronics. I like to make physical things. And where this starts to tie into this talk is that all of the things up here and just about anything I've properly documented is something I've actually made at work. So not necessarily on my own time, but something that I've been able to do through the side projects at my day job. And I'm fortunate that at Moving Brands, we do try to and do build a culture around doing work that's adjacent to the actual business of the work we do. So I'm going to be quiet for a couple of minutes and show a video of what that looks like at our work, hopefully. We'll be able to see them live on the internet. And yes, Ben, is that you we see out there looking rather chilly? I hope so. Can you see us OK? Yeah, we can see and hear you very well indeed. Now, where are you exactly? We're on the western side of the Gobi Desert, just on the edge of the Bogged Mountains in Outer Mongolia. <laughs>
And there are a few reasons, the benefits of that, why you would want to do that. I think one is about keeping up. So the world's changing. There's always new technologies. There's always new processes. There's always new people. There's always new ideas. And it's important to make sure that we're, we don't get stuck in the rut. So as one, for instance, which I have here, it's a few years ago, desktop 3D printing became a thing that a regular person could achieve, feasibly do. And what we knew of 3D printing was that a couple of people in the studio could make a 3D model, send it off to Shapeways with money, and get something back in the post. So we decided to build a project around getting a RepRap into the studio. We decided to make it complicated by printing in chocolate, but it was mostly about learning about 3D printing. And this was a way that sort of ev just about everybody across the studio built 3D models, got some hands-on experience, got to see what that looks like, and it was less that we developed deep expertise in 3D printing and more that we developed cultural competence so that if somebody came down and talked to us, we understood roughly what that landscape looks like, what the possibilities are like, and we had that sort of hands-on experience to give us a bit of a frame to understand a new technology. Another reason to do these sorts of things is to push yourself. So this is less about specifically picking one new idea, but looking at how you might expand outside of your usual day-to-day -day routine. So for example, this is a case where we have an industrial designer in London who had this idea for making these brackets that were a little more user-friendly, a little more attractive. And the pushing ourselves was asking us, if that's like the, the core of an initial idea, can we actually ideate a whole product, a whole sort of integrated physical and digital system for designing and building furniture that's more accessible for people to be able to do, customize something relatively cheaply. So as an agency, we tend to, I think, come in for pieces of long, longer processes. And this was a way for us to push ourselves to say, let's start at the be very beginning. Let's go through product ideation. Let's go through prototyping. Let's go through testing and research and like see a process from end to end. Again, it's not necessarily about building a product as the end result, but about understanding when we come in from the outside, into a piece of a pro process, what does that whole process look like and what does it feel like? Another thing that is valuable about R&D is it keeps us interested. Um, a lot of us spend a lot of time looking at screens. I spend a lot of time drawing diagrams and there's an enjoyment in tangibility, right? Again, it's not about a specific piece of technology. It's not about a process, but it's just about getting away from the computer, getting your hands dirty. Um, this is an example of one of our team members in London playing with these little Wi-Fi modules and having these boxes that you can use to control, um, control a screen and just play with how you know something's moving through space and how you connect that with a screen. It's nothing super new, but it's fun to play with and it's fun to talk about. And I think the end result and really the big goal is this is something that lets you change. So anybody working in any organization knows you build up an inertia, you build up some processes, changing those processes is hard. And this gives us a test bed to try out new things. It gives us, we can try out not only new ideas and new bits of technology, but new ways of working. What are the tools that we can use to build stuff and test stuff? What are the tools that we can use to communicate with each other? And we can do it in a semi-isolated way. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it works well, it's something that can start to feed into the larger organization. So it's a way to keep moving and changing and overcome some of our organizational inertia, which all is good and somewhat utopian. And now everybody can go home and stop doing their day job and do side projects all the time. Um, yeah, but why aren't you going to do it? Like, What's keeping you from doing this, especially in a business, in a larger group of people? And R&D, th this view of R&D, it's an investment, right? You're putting effort and time and cost into it in the hopes that it's going to make you better. It's going to make you your business better. It's going to make your people happier. It's going to make the work you do better. There are real costs 
Um, for us, as an agency where you know we provide a service, the time we spend doing R&D is time we spend not providing a service. So there's a really tangible cost there. There's resources, especially if you're building physical things. You need space to do that. You need materials to do that. Um, you need things you're going to break because you don't know what you're doing. So there's sort of a leap of faith that you need to trust that that real cost is going to pay off in the end. And you need to sort of develop your own sense of balance of how much cost. Like, are you putting in enough effort that you're going to see enough through that it feeds back? Or are you putting in too much effort and not seeing results? You have to trust that you're going to get somewhere and be willing to play with how you get that right balance. And I think a big barrier to especially starting this at an organization is how do you actually do it? Like, literally, how do you structure R&D in the context of a larger business? And this is insider baseball time, I think, because we've actually done a lot of R&D around our R&D process. I've been in moving brands for about six years. I've been involved in this the whole time we've been there, and we've tried lots of different ways, and we've iterated lots of different processes. So you're going to bear with me, and I'm going to tell you all of our different processes very quickly. So we started, which I think is pretty typical for a younger agency, with occasional projects. So this might be for an event. So we did something for a maker fair or for a holiday project. And it's good, especially as a young agency, because it gives you things you can talk about. So if you're working on a lot of client work that's under NDA and you don't have a very long backlog, you can make things that you can talk about that are exciting and showcase what you can do. It's problematic because it's incredibly disruptive. So you're working toward a deadline. You're sort of, by definition, doing something that you don't know how to do necessarily, because that's what makes it exciting. But it means you're not necessarily very good at predicting how much effort it's going to take. And I would say this is where a lot of my late nights have come from, less the client work and more, why did we decide we were going to make 100 conductive ink light up Christmas ornaments? Um, so eventually, we hit a point where we are realizing this wasn't maybe the best way for us to move forward. We took a little bit of a tangent where we looked into doing this less about for internal deadlines and more about finding somebody who had a good idea and working with them to develop that. Um, it's a bit of a tangent, I think, because it starts to move into a different business model. It's not something we would say we're not going to ever do, but it's not quite the same story as how do we build a culture of learning and innovating within the context of our own business. So we decided to go for less disruption and look at, can we just have anybody at the business, in the time that they're not actively working, have projects that they can work on? Again, you know, agency work tends to be up and down. There are sort of slack time sometimes in between projects. So can we fill that slack time? Which is good because it's less disruptive. Anybody can get involved, which is nice. Um, but it's really hard to do that. I think the most success we ever had in this is like, very little things that take about a day, maybe a couple of days, because it's just really hard to build momentum and coordinate with people and get anything other than a small one-off project. So building on that, we decided we would find a smaller set of people and dedicate a chunk of time, right? It's the 20% time, time story, where you just set aside more time and you can start to coordinate, you can start to build more projects. I think where we ran into problems with this, there's two things. One is it's not necessarily true. Just because you put time on the schedule doesn't mean that you're not actually just filling that time with client work. And the second one is it starts to isolate an R&D team. There's the people who have dedicated time and the people who don't have dedicated time. And you have to work pretty hard to figure out how to support that which is relatively sustainable, but make sure that it's feeding the whole business, not just the handful of people who have that time. It was working reasonably well, so we decided that one of the challenging challenges we were running into was more of the, it doesn't quite happen, we couldn't quite coordinate. So trying to build more of a team, build processes, build ways of working, try and build a story that we can cohere around to start building projects that are a little more ambitious, um, which started to work. But what was interesting after about a year of trying that was that we found that the best stuff coming out of that approach was stuff that was actually quite close to client work. It wasn't doing client work, but it was sort of ideas that were sparked by client work. Or a client came to us with a massive problem. We could help them with this problem. But that was really interesting. Could we look into that? 
So we've started just now, and I can't tell you what the pros and cons of this are, uh, making sort of this maverick R&D team where we almost offer ourselves up to other teams and say, you're talking to an interesting client, they have interesting problems, there's a scope of work, but what's the long-term vision? What aren't we answering that either is going to be interesting to us or potentially interesting to the client as part of a longer conversation? All of that is about our context, right? That's saying we're an agency, we live in a certain business context, we have a certain business model. Depending on what sort of organization you're in, what you're trying to do, different models are going to work, right? So I've seen people talk about building maker spaces more at places that sell products where their main issue is employee retention and making a positive working environment. And they have different models and that works for them because it's suited to their context. And ultimately, even though I just walked you through a bunch of models, it's not really about the model, right? I think the thing about all of those models is that we've just been doing this for, I mean, the whole time I've been, before I've been there, we've been doing this for 18 years. And if something doesn't work, we try something else. So it's iterating, but always being committed that we want to have a culture that learns. We want to take time to build things. And as a company, we want to invest in that. So in that frame, oh, I'm about done. I think there's probably four things that, regardless of the model, are important that work for us and make this work. And I think one, sort of the foundation, is it's about making things. It's about building stuff, trying stuff out, getting it into people's hands, seeing what works. There's a little bit about tangibility and a lot about just seeing something through to the end so you have something that does what you want it to do at the end, rather than writing or thinking about what something might do. I think a key part, and this is where I'm, I was saying side projects is a misnomer, is it needs to be part of work. It's not stuff people do on their own time. It's not even giving people some resource support for stuff they do on their own time. And I think there's two reasons for that. Um, one reason is a cultural reason. Like if you want to build a culture of learning at work, it should happen at work. And you know, people should be able to see it happening. People should be able to participate when and how that works. I think the other part is, if you are even helping people do stuff outside of work, you're basically helping people who have time, have fewer responsibilities. So it just makes it more unequal unless you can actually support it in the context of work at work. It's important to invite people in. Like I was saying, I think sort of the danger I see for our current model is it does start to isolate an R&D team from the rest of the business. I think it's important that it's connected to the whole business, not a piece that's separated. And I think it's also important to invite people from the outside world in. If you're making prototypes, give them to people. If you're building something, share it, talk about it, show it to people. Be willing to let people see your absolutely broken thing that doesn't quite work and learn from how they interact with it. And that's basic. I mean, that's design, right? And I think the thing more recently that is becoming interesting is that this is supposed to be a virtuous circle, right? It's supposed to be that we're doing this to make work better, to make the work we do better, to make everybody at the work more happy about where they're working and more excited about the work they're doing, which then makes the work we do better. And I think it's been sort of an interesting almost marker that it's working is when we're feeling inspired by the day job. We're inspired by our clients and the problems they have. And we're coming to them looking for what we're going to get inspired by. And we're having interesting conversations, which again, makes that investment, those costs and that time and that challenge of constantly iterating on the process worth it because we're doing better work, we're doing more interesting work, and you know, hopefully we're constantly learning. And that was roughly on time, so thank you. And we're on the oh.